All right. Um, and now we begin the, the phase of uh, or our last phase of, uh, of lightning talks for this conference. Uh, and to kick us off, I am very happy to welcome So Miyagawa um, to talk about adaptation of IIIF for audiovisual resources for endangered languages in Japan for language preservation. And uh, just a quick note that for all the lightning talk folks, uh, we'll be giving you a two minute warning just so that we can uh, be fair and keep everyone uh, on track. So take it okay. away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Hi, my name is So Miyagawa. Uh, I came from a Japanese institute uh, called Ninjal, which is not a research institute for ninjas, but for languages and linguistics. <laughs> I will talk about it later. Um, first, I would like to explain endangered languages in Japan. In 2009, UNESCO summarized that about 2,500 languages out of about 7,000 languages worldwide are endangered. Among them, there are eight endangered languages in Japan. The most severely endangered language is Ainu, an indi indigenous language in Hokkaido, Kuril Islands, and Southern Sakhalin. Alongside Ainu, the Japonic language family has seven endangered languages, Hachijo language, Amami language, Kunigami language, Okinawa language, Nyako language, Yayama language, and Yunaguni language. Also, many Japanese dialects are uh, endanger, endangered and oppressed by standard Japanese. Uh, here, the here is the map of eight endangered languages in Japan, uh, Ainu. Uh, yeah, one sec, I will use a pointer. Uh, laser pointer is there. Yeah, Ainu is here. Hachijo here and here. Uh, Amami, Kunigami, Okinawa, Miyako, Yayama, and Yonaguni. These are five, uh, sorry, these are eight languages which are endangered in Japan. Those endangered languages are very dif different. For example, the word meaning moon is tsuki, uh, tsuki in standard Japanese, but chichi in Naha Okinawan, and interestingly, ksks in Ogami Miyakoan. Um, the degree of difference is higher than that of Romance languages, Spanish Luna, Italian Luna, French Dune, uh, ex exemplified here. And uh, the moon in Ainu is completely different, Kunechup, uh, because it is um, language isolate. The National Institute for Japanese Language and Linguistics, called Ninjal, is one of the national institutes in Japan located in Tokyo. Since it, its establishment in 1984, sorry, 80, 1948, sorry, establishment in 1948, it has been collecting resources of endangered languages in Japan. For example, text, audio, video, maps, and so on. Most of them have not yet been published digitally. So we are creating Ninjao Digital Archive Ninda. It is built on Omeka S, an open, open source CMS for digital archives, uh, following linked open data by exporting data in RDF, and most importantly, it is, it is IIIF compatible. We provide images, videos, and audio through IIIF. We have maps of endangered languages and dialects. Here you can open the image. Uh, yeah, also, wait a sec. Here there are four buttons. Triple uh, Manifest, Mirado 3, Universal Viewer, and Triple IF Curation Viewer made by CODH in Japan. Uh, and yeah, this is, we also have a rare typeset print. For example, this is. Aesop's fables translated into late Middle Japanese by Jesuits in the 16th to 17th century, and it has very interesting dialectal features from Nagasaki. Then we have audio and videos of endangered languages and dialects provided through IIIF. We are using uh, Universal Viewer and also uh, Mirado for that. And this is also video. Uh, we are using now currently, yeah, this one is a universal viewer. And uh, the video itself is a yeah, talk by a Miyako speaker in Miyako language. 
All the metadata is provided in RDF. If you click the RDF button, you can get the JSON-LD file. Also, we have rich searching and ordering function like this. Uh, yeah, we have more plans to enrich the database. First, we are trying to make subtitles for our videos. This is an example from another project by Yuka Hayashi. And this is Mirado 3, is, which is customized mainly by Jun Honma in the project with Yona Takashi and Kyono Nagasaki. This is Miyakoan language. Uh, also, we are now providing the data to Japan Search, a cross-search platform like Europeana, entirely using IIIF, uh, developed by the National Diet Library of Japan. Um, yeah, this is a page from Japan Search, and this is a page for like each entry of Japan Search item. Yeah. Also, we are now providing uh, also, we are now embedding a so-called self-museum. This uh, self-museum app is a virtual museum created by Culture Japan, uh, mainly uh, Masahide Kanzaki, Kanzaki. And this is a kind of VR uh, museum, which is com totally IIIF compatible. Uh, so if you input uh, IIIF manifest here, you can uh, automatically make a museum like that. It is also nice to have uh, via Google <laughs> to enjoy this museum. Uh, you can also see the metadata uh, from here, and also you can you can uh, open other uh, viewers. For example, this is a uh, trip trip curation. No, sorry, Mirado, and. Uh, this is ongoing project that we are now embedding this uh, self-museum into our Minda database. So, thank you, that's all. All right, wonderful. Um, up next, I'd like to welcome Matt Jordan and Mark Baggett to talk about uh, Canopy, a site generator um, for digital collections. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Mark Baggett and with Matt Jordan, he and I have been exploring the question whether or not you can uh, use a single IIIF collection manifest to uh, generate a, a digital site. And um, to help explore this question, we've created uh, a project called Canopy IIIF, which is a Next.js framework. And uh, the whole idea behind uh, Canopy JS really comes from the idea that IIIF promotes reuse of data and works from repositories. Um, and that's in, of course, like computational reuse, but also in like interoperability for things like aggregating content from other repositories, other uh, providers, annotating uh, works elsewhere, um, but also in storytelling and exhibit building um, around works. And uh, so this brings us to Canopy. Uh, Canopy takes a single IIIF collection manifest. It um, uh, parses it. It iterates over all the metadata properties and the metadata properties of the manifest that are within it. And it generates out a site. And uh, you'll get to see that in just a second. Uh, and we see there's several use cases for this. Um, uh, for instance, exhibitions letting libraries, archives, museums uh, build exhibitions around the content that they store in another system um, and pull that into like one thing or even pull uh, content from more than one uh, repository and build a um, single site or maybe even for like a smaller institution take a bunch of static um, images or AV uh, and some manifest and build a brand new site and put that online without the need of a database or any really complexity or IT. And now I'm gonna turn over to Matt for more. Thank you. Um, yeah, so 
As uh, Canopy aims to uh, be a triple IF fluent framework for developing uh, static sites, it can uh, represent both presentation two and three collections. The uh, triple IF manifests and the content resources within them will remain with the providing institutions though. It is not being brought in, they're just being referenced still. Um, if your uh, collection, for instance, had 50 manifests, you now have 50 pages representing those manifests. Um, the label, the summary, and the metadata from within those manifests are now pieced together in a search index uh, where those 50 pages are search results. The metadata can be dictated to be automatically faceted within that search results page. And uh, you can extend uh, and reference those uh, manifests and the, the, the works represented by those manifests in Markdown on other pages. Uh, and because it's a triple IF uh, product in some way, we're seeking to make sure that we uh, support uh, most, uh, if not all, triple IF uh, presentation uh, three uh, and uh, various extensions. So here's an example of a nav place extension being supported in a, uh, on a map, and those points all represent the manifest. Um, just a little bit of uh, understanding of triple IF collections. Uh, the basics is that a collection can be a collection of manifests and collections, uh, and uh, Mark went over those use cases earlier. A collection does not necessarily need to be fixed to one specific thing. It can be fairly dynamic and moldable. Uh, the canopy configuration is really simple. Uh, the code, uh, the, the, all you really need to do is dictate which collection you want to reference, which manifests you want to be your featured uh, items in that on the website, uh, and which metadata labels you want to be automatically faceted. You might not want everything, obviously, to be a facet. Um, the canopy build process is very simple. The, uh, what it, what, it, what it will do is it'll go out and request the, the URI of the collection. It'll upgrade it to 3.0. If it does not, if it isn't already, it's going to iterate through all the manifests. It's gonna keep it pretty shallow right now and not dive into collections. Uh, and, excuse me. <laughs> and, uh, and then each one of those manifests will then become a work and the facets and the search index will become uh, API routes within the uh, within the uh, uh, next JS website that is generated. A little bit about that search API route. Uh, the uh, each of these routes are actually going to deliver a triple IF collection as well. Uh, and so, basically, uh, building off what Mark said, uh, there is now an ability to hit your that static site and return research results. Same thing for facets. In this example, the uh, the date and the value of 1909 will return a triple IF collection with uh, 26 page results. Here's an example of of a project that we are working on right now uh, that will spin up a triple IF, uh, a, excuse me, a, it'll spin up a site that will be sourced from two different providers, the University of Illinois and Northwestern. Uh, and here's an example uh, building off of a Bodleian uh, Kenanichi collection. And uh, here's an example of the markdown generating a, of a page. Real quickly, um, I just mentioned there's some challenges to this. We recognize that we're working with presentation data. Presentation data is not structured data. So you're gonna have a little bit of everything from metadata from different places, but we do think that we can have some minimal metadata remediation that just happens in via configuration, so we're working on that. Um, also, we recognize that certain viewers are best for certain projects, so our whole idea here is to not use just one viewer, just make it uh, easy to bring in 
uh, whatever viewer you want. And then we also want to um, uh, create docs and tools for helping people go from no triple F to be able to use this. And uh, yeah, so here's our um, roadmap. And uh, let us know if you have questions. Check us out on GitHub. Thanks. <laughs>
and use that to match the correct cur curated transcript text with the text in the boundary box, just using a simple heuristic method, you know, it's a distance and similarity measure, nothing clever, no training of ML models and so on. So it's an, something that you could do on any material quickly and easily. So that was the hypothesis. So that's what we tested in the experiment. So what we did was we wrote some simple code that would take the text segments that were identified by OCR or HTR, iterate through them, use some measure of similarity, and there's lots of these, you know, Levenstein distance, cosine similarity, metric longest common subsequence, and so on, and then try and find in the transcript text the block of text that would most closely match that. And then if it's above a certain threshold, replace the OCR text with the text from the transcript. Um, so we then remove that from the candidate list of matches and iterate. So it's a really simple process. This isn't a very clever algorithm. But the result was pretty good. So in the original um, data, we used Google Vision to do the OCR. It was better than most of the open source um, off-the-shelf tools. And we had a 74% word error rate in the uh, OCR data. This makes it sound worse than it was because the character error rate wasn't actually too bad. Once we'd run this simple al algorithm and aligned the transcript text with the Google Vision OCR, what we had was more like 16% word error rate, with about 50% of the lines being absolutely correct all the way through. We had a few findings. It's very contingent on how good your original OCR is. You need quite good segmentation. If the segmentation is really bad, you won't get very good results. The cloud-based services tended to give us better results, but there were some specialist OCR tools that did a good job. Things like Perl were very good, and some of the newer open source tools like Paddle OCR were pretty excellent. Um, segmentation can be a challenge, so you don't need the line boundaries and word boundaries to match exactly, but they're better if they do. Um, and the transcript order doesn't have to match the exact order of the OCR text, but again, it helps. So um, it's a bit more computationally challenging. So there is a demo. It's at this link. There's a caveat here. I just spun this demo up at the conference on a low resource cloud service. So if everyone hits it at once, it will probably go down. Uh, but at some point, I'll update the link on that site with a link to a faster version of the site and more people can try it. You can paste the manifest in here, select the canvas, run some OCR. If you have some transcript text, you can put it in and it will do a comparison between the two and generate your aligned text for you. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Up next, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Mike Bennett to talk about AAAF Prezi 3, um, a uh, potentially really useful library to many of you out there. Hello, I'm back again. You've sick of me. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk to you very quickly through um, AAAF Prezi 3, um, a Python library for creating and manipulating presentation API 3, uh, collections, manifests, other AAAF objects. It's kind of a follow up to the original AAAF Prezi library, which was the same for version 2. Um, so, a quick history of the library. Um, we started a sort of from scratch rewrite of the presentation 2 library. Um, about two, year, two and a bit years ago, um, a small group of us started meeting on, uh, online via the Slack channels, uh, and we kind of released version one at the end of last year. So if, uh, if you were at the online meeting last year, you would have seen us uh, kind of like, hey, it's coming soon, announcement. Um, so our development process, very simple, familiar, I think, to a lot of you in the AAAF community. We had open Zoom calls in the AAAF Slack. Um, out of this, there were some people who started turning up all the time, uh, always useful. Um, and so we started, basically they became the small maintainers group and uh, with some experimentation of a few libraries and approaches at the start, we settled into our work. We had a public hackathon, um, which, which, to which was a great attendance. I think there's quite a few people who are here today who came to the hackathon, helped us get the kind of very basic parts of the library all up and running. Um, and it's very simple in how it works. Um, it's based on a Python library called Pydantic, um, which does data classes and modeling, and then validation of these as JSON. Um, so you, you build all your data structures, and then you say, hey, Pydantic, load this thing. 
And it goes, okay, yes, it's bad. You're missing a label on your manifest. You don't have a language map. Um, so this kind of makes it very simple to, to model the entire structure of presentation three and using another library um, and Glenn's validator schema, JSON schema. We kind of do this on a semi-automatic basis. There's a few small tweaks we have to make to the output from uh, data model code gen, but essentially what happens is the JSON schema goes in and out comes a Pydantic model, which you can use then in Python uh, to construct objects matching that JSON schema. Uh, so on top of this then, our main work was to add some helper methods to kind of make the library actually quick and usable. So we have a couple of main types. We have like a make thing or add thing. So for example, if you have your manifest object in Python, it has an add canvas helper method so that rather than sort of having to create a canvas object and instantiate it and put all the things in and then add it to the manifest, you just go, hey, manifest.addCanvas. Um, likewise, canvas has an add image. Uh, so this will take care of like the nitty gritty in the middle, like adding an annotation page, adding the annotation. So you can call it just with, you know, the URL or canvas, add image at this URL with this label. Boop, off you go. Uh, the other helpers we have help sort of set properties and interfacing with external services. Um, so there's, you know, basically the utility helpers, the aim of this is to try and make the process as smooth as possible when you're scripting. Uh, so we have a set height width duration helper uh, anywhere that's applicable. Um, and, and things like the manifest objects have a create canvas from triple IF. Uh, so here you can call this method with the uh, image API endpoint and it will go and retrieve the info JSON uh, and, and build your objects for you. So uh, this is kind of the idea, yeah, like I said before, smoothing the process um, as much as we can. Uh, and then there are a few black magic helpers. So at this point, I want to send a special thanks to Rob Sanderson, wherever he's uh, lurking for digging far deeper into the internals of Python than I ever dared to do. Um, <laughs> so there's some very new useful things for example, obviously your labels actually have to be a, a language map um, and various other things. So we have some auto helpers where you can tell it, hey, if I don't tell you what the language is, it's by default this. So, you know, say non or English. Or, and then you can just assign the label as a string. So you don't have to worry about, oh, did I build the dictionary right? Did I remember to put the lists in the right place? You just say, hey, manifest label is my manifest. And you, it will come out with the correct formatted dictionary and everything there for you. Um, and so we have this applying to a couple of other things as well. We have uh, some properties like behavior, right, which always has to be a list. If you forget to supply a list, we just go, oh, okay, that should be a list. Doof, off you go. Um, and there's some auto helpers. So you can specify base IDs and have uh, all your objects get their IDs automatically. So you don't have to kind of keep setting the IDs for everything. Um, and probably the most useful thing we have is that we've started as a collective effort uh, to implement all of the cookbook recipes using the library. So uh, this was mentioned in the state of IIIF uh, talk. And, and so on the sort of GitLab, GitHub pages, you can find every recipe or as many as we've done so far with step by step, hey, run this code, this is how you do it. So uh, by example, almost implementing stuff. Um, and we have a few uses in the wild already. So. Uh, as far as we know, we know a few people at the Rockefeller Archive Center are using it. Um, the Internet Archive Project, which was mentioned before, uh, the National Gallery in the UK, uh, Rara Magnetica, which you saw us talk about this morning, and Jules is using it for a few things in Dash and the participatory image archives. Um, so quickly to look at the Internet Archive, um, as you saw from the, the State of AAAF talk, uh, AAAF Prezi 3, this library is powering the new AAAF Presentation 3 uh, output of the Internet Archive, so what will become, I think, the largest IIIF resource uh, that we know about. Um, and since they already had the metadata, it was really quick and easy. It's really a case of, hey, we have the metadata, feed a few lines of code in, and now we have manifest for 60 million items. Um, so you can get it on PIP uh, with GitHub. We have some documentation. Uh, we love your issues and use cases. Come and talk to us. We have a channel on the Slack. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to try one thing if I can get this thing to escape. This is the thing they say. You should always eat your own dog food, right? But I might have to, Glenn, because the conference has banned my domain name.
So if we can connect to Ed Jerome. This is how you make the slides for this presentation using the library. So with this amount of code, uh, it's 21 lines like this, but if you actually did total proper lines of code, it's eight lines of code, you get a manifest and you get the presentation in a mirrored door viewer. Thank you very much. Nicely done, thank you, Mike. Um, up next, uh, we have John Cameron uh, to talk about the implementation of uh, Prezi 3 in the Avalon media system. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm John Cameron from Indiana University, um, and I'm going to be talking about Avalon Media System, um, a software that we develop, and then what we're doing with Presentation 3. Um, so Avalon, just to give a brief overview, is a streaming access platform. Um, we're in the Sanvera community, so it's a Sanvera application. It's all Ruby on Rails stuff. Um, we use Fedora and Solar. Um, and Avalon is pretty much explicitly for AV content. So that's really the focus on it, um, and it's designed for library and archive use cases. Um, so some of the things that are particular to it are easy transcoding and flexible access controls. So it's intended to be a platform where you can easily get material onto the web and accessible. Um, and it's in use at a lot of institutions. So we heavily use at IU. We have an extremely large amount of uh, audio and moving image collections, um, but other people use it as well. So it is really a community project. Um, and of course, we want triple IF. Yes, presentation three, we get into time as well as space. Um, and um, basically, we have all these objects in the repository, and the basic thing is, of course, serialize them out into presentation three. Um, and then we also have additional projects. So Avalon Media System is sort of the turnkey application. And then we have all these little different libraries and things, um, including Ramp, which is our media object player the structural metadata editor, which is kind of a, a way to define time ranges, and the timeliner, which is a way to um, mark up uh, audio materials. Um, so just to briefly talk about this, so, so this is what we use to build our manifest. This is a gem that was originally developed by Trey Pendragon. Um, that's from the Sanvera community, and it basically turns our specific Sanvera models into presentation manifests. Um, and it has basic presentation three support, um, and most of the active development on this, I think, is, is us now as we keep um, modifying and changing the way our manifests are generated. Um, so to go into our project, so first, uh, RAMP. So this was formerly known as the Avalon React Triple IF Media Player, and you can see why we changed the name. Um, RAMP uh, can be whatever you want. Is it a backronym? You know, is it a vegetable? Um, it's up to you. Um, but essentially, uh, when we went to this, we wanted to make a new media player. Right now, we use a fork of media element JS that's very hard to maintain. Um, and this was a way to say, hey, we're going to use our, the IIIF that our application generates, and we're going to make a media player that reads that in and basically does what it needs to do. Um, and in doing so, we basically made this uh, React component library. So um, in the manifest, you know, there's all this information. And with RAMP, you can put the video player on the page, you can do a display for transcripts, you can do a display for structural metadata, um, and we're going to add other components. So it's all sort of getting fed in through IIIF, and then we're parsing it out and making it so you can render whatever on the page that you need to. Um, and our goal, you know, unlike UV or Mirador, um, we really want this to be like super lightweight, um, very AV focused, um, and easy to use like in the widest possible use cases. So our project is a little different in that a lot of people use it, and really we try to design it to be like the most broadly applicable, uh, which is its own sort of like dark domain. Um, yeah, so we use manifest over parsing. You know, we have this nice uh, React component that maintains state um, between all these things. Um, we switch to video JS, which is a little better than media element JS, um, and the whole idea is to have like these sensible defaults and functionality out of the box that you don't have to worry about. Even if you use something like VideoJS, you're going to need plugins for stream quality levels or, or what have you. Um, so here's one of our other projects, um, the Structural Metadata Editor. So as you can imagine, um, defined ranges and structures are, are a huge use case for us um, in the domain of time. 
um, and media material. Um, and so we have an internal XML structure in Avalon that's used to um, define those ranges. And this editor um, originally didn't use IIIF, and then we added IIIF. So it actually will take the XML, transform it into IIIF, um, you know, modify that document in memory, and then save it back to XML as needed. Um, and so the idea is that you know, eventually with a little more polish, this again could be something that people could use to define those ranges and save them to objects. Um, and right now this is just available within Avalon. Right, um, and the Timeliner, uh, this is uh, developed for us by Digirati and came out of an early project. Um, but this is another sort of annotation tool where um, it's sort of designed for the music use case. Uh, I've got a lunchroom manners example, but you can see it's basically like a bubble diagram creator where you can create these arbitrarily nested ranges. Um, and everything is natively IIIF, um, except there's a little object at the root for the Timeliner settings. Uh, I don't know if that makes it in the legal manifest. I've heard about those. Um, but uh, really, our sort of like next phase here as we try to work on ramp is improving the manifest generation and then making sure that it sort of goes back in. So we're very much about uh, you know eating our own dog food, um, always, always dog fooding. Um, and let's see. So one of the things that we've done um, were some of the things listed here. So um, you know, adding descriptive metadata. Um, you know, when you use a library to just serialize your model out, you might not get what you want. Um, and so going back and making sure that all the descriptive metadata is there in the way we want it. Um, captions and transcripts. Um, Authentication is really big for us. We have a bunch of other stuff that generally is associated with the object that gets tagged along. Um, everything is, it gets a waveform. Um, you can add images, PDFs, binaries, pretty much anything. So it needs to be, you know, sort of massively flexible. Um, and permalink information as well. Uh, yeah, so to just real quick, so auth is really important for us um, because moving image material, uh, you know, just sort of by its, by its nature is much more under copyright. Um, and we work with a lot of stuff um, that has copyright concerns, uh, you know, is only accessible to a certain thing. And a lot of institutions use Avalon um, and basically, you know, never serve anything publicly because it's gated to their institution or um, different things like that. So we actually ended up removing the auth service implementation that was kind of like, a first pass that we did just to make it more interoperable because the auth service that we had implemented in our manifest wasn't playing very nice with other players. Um, but that's something we're going to go back to soon, hopefully. Um, and of course, interoperability. Um, yeah, this is hard. So the AV group has this big spreadsheet that we've been doing testing on. Um, and really, you know, our whole goal is eventually that Avalon manifest should, um, you know, load in other players, even if it, it doesn't have. Um, sort of uh, a representation of everything that we have in the manifest that we would sort of do in an Avalon sort of way. Just making them be able to play for that interoperability is really important. Um, another thing, so of course, like, you know, going into this, you know, we have an object that we can generate a manifest for, but we have collections, playlists, um, you know, sort of structured lists of objects, um, you know, is a pretty common data structure. Uh, and there's no reason why we couldn't do this because we already have these sort of modeled within the own the specific Rails context that this app is going. Um, and another thing is user annotations on objects. Right now, we don't have any way to create, really create or display. And I think the expectation is that you know a lot of people who would be using manifests with a heavy amount of annotations that they want to want to see rendered in the media player. Um, and that's something we have yet to work on. Okay. Yeah. So what do we want to do? Uh, yeah. Again, make the experience good for end users, both for people using it and devs. Um, adding stuff, and then of course, transcripts, playlist captions, search API um, into the semantic hinterlands in the back, uh, and then hopefully figuring it all out. Um, anyway, AvalonMediaSystem.org is our website, um, and the AV Slack channel um, is a great place to see all the discussion that's currently going on. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Um, up next, we have uh, David Newberry talking about the physical dimension service uh, and interoperable doll houses. Hi there, everybody. It's really good to see you all. I'm glad to be out here. Um, hi, I, I'm David Newberry. Um, my day job is working for the Getty, where I lead the teams that build our software applications, our interfaces. Um, Things that are useful, helpful, academic, help share the knowledge of the Getty with the world. 
Um, what I'm about to talk to you is not part of my day job. This is something that I'm doing um, not officially for the Getty. Um, and I thought that's important as we get further into this. So IIIF, as I hope you know, what day four of the conference, lets you get images in multiple sizes. You can get a image, you get the image at one sixth scale or one tenth scale. Um, hopefully you know about this, otherwise you're probably at the wrong conference. Um, but you also can use IIIF this way, where you take the physical size of the thing that is depicted and you can use IIIF to get representations of that image at different physical sizes. Um, there's an extension in IIIF called the Physical Dimension Service, uh, where you can add a property or an extension to your canvas that says one pixel is this many centimeters. Um, it's been part of IIIF since about 2014, and it really is helpful when you want to talk about that, how does the picture that you're seeing map back into the real world? And so, I asked myself, because this is one of these things I keep saying, wouldn't it be nice to play with this? How can I convince my organization and other organizations to start doing this? And so I decided the most useful thing I could do was to build a system that let you make um, IIIF for Barbies. <clears throat> and so this is an application where you can import a manifest and say, I'd like a IIIF manifest and I'd like the image scaled for a Barbie dollhouse or a Playmobil dollhouse or Lego minifigures, to be able to get these images at the right size for various scales. Um, and then you can take that thing and you can print it out on a piece of paper at exactly that right scale, cut it out, and put it in your dollhouse. Um, how does this work? Um, you add to your canvas a little annotation that's a service annotation. It says, what's the unit of your, you know, what dimensions are this measured in? inches or centimeters or millimeters. You could say how many of these exist per pixel. So the one I was looking at, it's you know, 0 0.0025 inches per pixel. Um, and just as a caveat here, this is one of these things that is being migrated up to D3. The context may change slightly. Um, let's see how that goes, but it won't change dramatically. And so the question that I asked myself is, you know, this is a lot of fun to build. This is really fun to demo. It's fun to get up here and talk to you. Why is this useful? Um, part of it is really, you know, sort of for my kids or for other people. I really like the idea as a museum that what we can do here is take the art off the walls of the museum and bring it into places where people live. Let people operate with these things as something that you own or something that you can play with, something that you can make your own. And this is one of the ways that I think we can really do that. Um, this also has, you could probably use this realistically. I have worked with a bunch of curators. Every curator I've ever met prints everything out and staples it to their wall and moves it around. They all have some weird way that they come up with scale images that may or may not work. This is really convenient for them to say I wanted it, you know, one foot to one inch or, you know, one meter to 10 centimeters to put in those sorts of scales. Um, also, IIIF can be super, super nerdy, and we've had a lot of really amazing, super, super nerdy talks here. And one of the things that I think toys like this can help with are giving us demos that we can use to show to people that are approachable, um, that help explain the potential of what we can do in a different way. Um, and finally, uh, I really like the idea that I can do a demo and show things that are this shockingly pink to so many people and demonstrate <clears throat> that we can be that kind of community. So. Thank you all very much. There's a demo out at AAAFforDolls.DavidNewbury.com. I might be the first Mattel-linked AAAF project uh, we've heard about. I'm open to being proved wrong, but thank you, David. Um, up next, I'd like to welcome uh, Nick Lycana uh, to talk about AAAF and TEI and the native bound, unbound platform. Hello, everybody. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, native bound, unbound project. Uh, in this project, we're constructing an archive of indigenous enslaved people in the Americas. The project aims to tell the stories of millions of indigenous people 
who were enslaved. The final website will publish uh, primary sources online and create an interconnected matrix of these people, the events in their lives, and the places where they lived and worked. Uh, in this lightning talk, I want to share how we're using IIIF in this project as an interoperable transport, transport protocol. We're using that third I in IIIF, interoperability, uh, to move text and images, not just between image servers and end user web browsers, but between multiple, pl multiple software platforms. While the text and the references to the images are moving from system to system, the big heavy image files are staying in one place. The, uh, let's see. Uh, the native Bound on Bound project collects uh, images from a variety of primary sources. There are over a dozen, dozen different digital assets ranging from baptismal records to census records to court cases, tombstones, oral histories. And while we're able to acquire high quality images of these objects, they are often not served via IIIF by their holding institutions. So many assets begin their journey by being uploaded to our IIIF image server. We are using uh, the Cantaloupe image server fronted by a simple web-based interface that facilitates users uploading images into ordered batches. These batches are then grouped together into a manifest. Um, sometimes these batches, like often when we're doing uh, digital critical editions or other sort of archival projects, like a single um, set of images in a manifest would represent uh, an entire document. But often what is happening here when they're looking for these particular records is that they're really just grabbing like, okay, there's a census record that's 300 pages into this, this collection of census records from this particular state, and we just want that one. So these batches aren't necessarily complete documents, although later in this process we try to pull them together into complete documents when we present them on the website. Or not complete documents, but present them together as things that came from the same document. So once these batches are grouped into a manifest, uh, we uh, create a new transcription project uh, uh, in the From the Page project, in the, in the software called From the Page. Uh, by creating a manifest uh, on our own server first, we're able to keep the images where they uh, ultimately need to be and uh, serve them uh, from there on our website. So you can kind of see how Cantaloupe Image Server here is in the center, and all these different software uh, uh, platforms are all talking to that same image server, but at each step of the way, we're generating a new manifest. Um, so using the uh, awesome From the Page software from Brumfield Labs, transcribers and domain experts transcribe the text in a uh, public crowdsourcing environment. And then these texts are then vetted and approved by uh, one of the project's editors. And then the editors can export the completed transcriptions and associated page images uh, to fair copy from, uh, from the page's uh, IIIF export option. Fair copy uh, is a specialized word processor for the study and transcription of primary sources in literature and history. And it re reads and writes text marked up in uh, XML according to the uh, text initiative, uh, text encoding initiative guidelines. And we're using fair copy in uh, the native bound on bound project to structure and annotate transcriptions and translations in a variety of formats. Um, the fair copy interface can be customized for each project so that editors have just the elements and attributes from TEI that they need. There's over 500 elements in TEI, and many of them are very esoteric. But we kind of customize it so that if you're doing transcription, you're just working with transcription elements. If you're doing translation, you're just working with those. Um, and so um, each, you know, the user can mark up the names and people of places as well as identify events. So they're going through and going through first in the transcriptions that are coming over from uh, from, from the page, we're getting transcriptions that are in the language of the actual text. These are diplomatic transcriptions. And these are often uh, then translated into English. Uh, and then that translation is then further marked up for uh, named entities, for structure, so that we can publish it properly, uh, looking for dates so that we can create timelines and things like this. Um, and so that, um, that, uh, that process uh, takes place in uh, fair copy. Uh, 
And those translations are often coming, so we'll have the transcriptions coming in from, from the page, but then often we'll uh, just be getting the translations in from the translation folks uh, in uh, Microsoft Word, which we then just export to plain text and bring those in and then mark them up into TEI uh, within fair copy. So um, we also use uh, Archive Engine, which works with fair copy to provide version control and collaboration features. And this was developed to support the Sapientia project at the University of Quebec. And using Archive Engine, the whole team can browse the repository texts and they can has a simple check-in, check-out mechanism. So we find that many of our non-technical collaborators have trouble working with something like Git. Uh, this provides, Archive Engine provides a simple check-in, check-out mechanism that's integrated into the editing environment of Fair Copy. So all you need to do is click check it in. It's on the server. Now it's served by a REST API and other services can work with it, uh, including uh, Edition Crafter which is a recent project that we're still developing uh, with the um, Making and Knowing project at Columbia University. And this project takes the folio viewer from the Secrets of Craft and Nature Digital Critical Edition and generalizes it into a reusable React component. Uh, and that component consumes the IIIF manifest that's coming from Archive Engine. And um, in the, inside that uh, manifest are uh, web annotations that cl cr contain the textual layers for each folio. So each folio has both an XML layer as well as, or each layer has an HTML and an XML representation. And then each, uh, that there can be multiple layers, a transcription and a translation. So that's basically it. So thank you. Uh, there's the link to the project if you'd like to learn more about it. Thank you, Nick. Um, and last but not least, uh, for the lightning talk session, we have uh, Phil Plankner um, talking about the Mirador upgrade at Harvard. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to make this quick and like whiz bang through this because I know you probably want coffee and snacks, so I don't want to be known as the impediment to that. Um, so. Start off. I'm Phil Plentzner. I work for Harvard uh, University Te Library Technology Services. Right, how do I know how to move this? All right. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I'm going to talk about uh, how Harvard Library uses Mirador, um, how we're currently on Mirador 2, and I'm trying to get to Mirador 3, um, and um, kind of show an example of like a sandbox that we have right now with Mirador 3, and basically a bunch of other stuff that's happening um, along with that because, you know, we can't just upgrade Mirador 3, like while the car's up on the lift, we might as well do a bunch of other stuff. So kind of go over all that. Okay, so um, how does Harvard Library use Mirador? We have like a few different um, main applications that all use Mirador. Um, some of them have different instances of Mirador. Um, they're all Mirador 2 though, but there's, some of them are heavily customized, some of them are lightly customized. The idea here is to get up to Mirador 3 and um, use um, kind of all the more standardized um, kind of implementations of IIIF, you know, the 3.0 versions of Image API, Presentation API, um, Authorization API, et cetera. So um, what are kind of some of the things that we want to um, utilize with Mirador 3? Um, we want the multilingual support. We want to be able to build our own custom plugins, do our own custom theming. Um, all that kind of stuff is, is provided out of the box uh, by Mirror 3, so we're looking forward to doing that. All right, so um, this is an example um, kind of screenshot of our Mirror 3 sandbox. There's a link to it um, at the top that I encourage you to look at. It's basically uh, just a Dockerized uh, application. It's running Node.js and Express um, that kind of just has a um, Mirror viewer embedded on a, on a page. Um, and we're using it to kind of build custom plugins on, um, do custom theming and stuff like that. Um, we also have behind the scenes, um, also have an O-embed server that we're building. So basically the idea would be that um, all those uh, applications that I showed you on the previous slide would be able to call the O-embed service um, and get back either both the IIIF manifest and kind of a um, embeddable um, HTML that they can just plug into their site. Um, it also includes other 
you know, pretty simple metadata that they might want to display on the page as well. Um, and so um, there's examples to the GitHubs uh, for both of those things there. So um, behind the scenes, um, we have something called MPS, which is a multimedia presentation service. Uh, my colleague at Harvard, uh, Katie Amaral, is uh, one of the main developers on that. Um, and it's, it does a bunch of different things, but in um, the context of this discussion, at the end of the day, it's gonna provide us with um, IIIF manifests in, uh, in the most up-to-date format so that we can use them uh, with Mirador 3. And uh, this is a kind of a crazy workflow of the OEMBED service, but basically on the far right side is the uh, MPS uh, uh, application, and then in the middle is the OEMBED service, and then on the left side is the application that would be making the call. So it's basically calling the OEMBED, which goes over to MPS, gets the, uh, gets the material that it needs, sends back the uh, IIIF manifest and the embeddable code. Um, so along with that, um, we're also actively involved in the uh, Mirador Core React upgrades. Um, there might have been a little talk about this um, amongst people here. Um, there was also a Mirador dev discussion yesterday, um, but basically uh, we're trying to get the, the core Mirador application up to date um, to uh, the latest version of React, which is React 18, Material UI 5, um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, we're gonna be tagging releases soon, right now. Um, the master branch of the repository of Mirador is on React 17. So if you did want to try that, you could you know, basically pull down that branch and build it yourself and, and try it out. I do have a link there to uh, um, kind of a GitHub page where I've specifically done that. Um, if you wanted to take a look or test it out, throw, throw some of your manifest in it and see if it works, um, that would be helpful. Um, I've also have a discussion thread on um, on the uh, Mirador uh, project page um, where we're kind of like tracking uh, some of the work. Um, we're also building a bunch of custom Mirador plugins um, to go along with our Mirador 3 upgrade. Um, I won't go into all of these in detail, but a couple I'd like to point out uh, specifically is the, uh, the Mirador PDE IIIF plugin. Um, it's kind of like taking um, the PDE IIIF application that uh, Johannes uh, Bader um, uh, built um, that's separate and um, and we're turning it into a plug-in. Um, that's something we're working uh, really closely with COGAP uh, on. Um, their developer John and um, Tristan have uh, been very uh, crucial in uh, in making that kind of thing come to come to, uh, to come to life. Um, and we also have um, like a help plug-in that'll like show help uh, dialog boxes and a custom uh, branding feature where we can put uh, you know. Harvard specific, you know, like the shield icon or something on the Mirador viewer um, in a simple way without kind of like forking the code. Um, so yeah, kind of uh, wrapping up just in conclusion, um, if you wanna collaborate with us on any of this kind of stuff, um, I welcome you to, to join our Mirador community calls. Right now they're Thursdays at 12 Eastern, um, but there has been discussion about moving it to a, a time that's a little more uh, accessible to all. Um, so keep an eye out for that. There's also uh, the discussion thread I uh, mentioned previously. You can email me. You can also find me on the IIIF Slack. Um, there's also a Mirador Devs uh, channel on Slack that um, is also worth checking out. So thank you. All right. Thank you.